We've come to the finale of the life of Jesus. Jesus um, is about to fulfill the mission that he came into the world to fulfill. It's, it's going to be his greatest victory. It's going to be... Um, The main reason that he came, now don't, don't misunderstand what I'm saying. Everything that Jesus did had great value and importance. The life of Jesus was to demonstrate what it, what it is to walk in communion with the Father. And this event, though, is the very purpose that he had come to accomplish and so that's what we're going to spend some time in this morning. I, I, I think us understanding what this means and, and the ramifications of these events that we're looking at this morning is, is paramount to our Christian life and to our, our ability to, uh, to live uh, a, a life of surrender and obedience to him and, and appreciate what he's accomplished on our behalf. And so the, I think that one, one of the pivotal uh, doctrines of the Bible is, is Jesus going to the cross. And so we're gonna take some time this morning and, and look at these events. One of the things that um, Jesus uh, has done is he, he's, he celebrated what is known as the Passover feast with his disciples. He took the 12 up into the upper room and he begins to uh, partake in this meal with them. In the middle of it, he takes the bread and he breaks it. And then he distributes it to his disciples. And he tells them, this is my body, which is offered for you. And then he would take the blood and and. Uh, the, 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 the cup, and it, was, it, was, it would have been the wine that, that, that they would have been drinking at the Passover meal, and he pours it into a cup, and he says, this is my blood, which is offered for you. And so they had just experienced uh, Jesus and, and, and was, were aware that Jesus was talking about shedding his blood, and Jesus was talking about offering up his body. The, the disciples were well aware of what Jesus uh, had said, but somewhere along the line, it didn't compute. Because they're still thinking on a very natural level when Jesus is trying to communicate to them on a spiritual level. And I think that's the danger that, that you and I can, can also face. It's We're thinking of all of this just on a physical realm when in reality, God is wanting us to understand what's happening in the heavenlies, what's happening in the spiritual realm. And I, my prayer this morning is that we, we would grasp that, that, that this is something way more than just a, 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 a physical event taking place. There's something happening in the spiritual realm that I think has great ramifications for our Christian life and for our ability to commune with a holy God. And that, that, that's really what we're, we're covering this morning. Notice what happens. We're going to begin in verse 39. Notice uh, there in verse 39, it says, coming out, that's out of the upper room, Jesus making his way outside the gates of Jerusalem. They went to the Mount of Olives as he was accustomed and his disciples followed him. And when he came to the place, he said to them, pray that you may not enter into temptation. This was the custom of Jesus. And I find that to be interesting that on a regular basis, whenever Jesus was in Jerusalem, he had this little private spot in, um, on the Mount of Olives. We know it as the Garden of Gethsemane. And the word Gethsemane means the, the pressing or the olive press. And Jesus would go there on a regular basis, so much so that Judas knows exactly where Jesus is going to be as he brings the chief priest and the Roman guards and all of those who arrest Jesus. J Judas knows where to find him because Jesus would go to this place regularly. And it was a place where he would spend time in prayer. It was a place where he would be Strengthen. We're going we're gonna to see that in the passage this morning. It was his custom to go there. And, and what, what, what's interesting is if Jesus saw it important to pray, guys, how much more do you and I need to find time to pray? If that was his custom. You know, the thing about Jesus, the son of God, 
saw it important to find time to commune with his father. You and I should see that as a great importance as well. Prayer. Matter of fact, as he's with his disciples, one of the things he tells his disciples, he says, pray that you may not enter into temptation. It was going to be the, the, the power that they were going to need in order not to stumble in this time that they were about to face. You see, it, it's, it's prayer that gives us the power to overcome the temptations that we face. And Jesus was telling the disciples that very thing. He said, look, if you're going to overcome the temptations that, that are going to come your way in the next hours ahead of you, he says, you're, you're going to have to be people who pray. We know that every one of them failed the test. And, and it wasn't the first test they're going to fail. They, they, they failed every test that Jesus was giving them that night. They were fighting who's going to be the greatest when Jesus says to, to, to be great is to be the servant of all. They're, they're going to be disputing that, you know, no one, all of them are, are going to, you know, um, have this position of power. And, and Jesus goes, you guys are going to sit with me on, in my father's, you know, kingdom and you're going to be on thrones. But right now your heart, your, your role is to serve others. And, and, and they, they, didn't, they didn't grasp that. Jesus is going to tell Peter who says, Lord, um, I'm willing to die with you. I, I'm, I'm willing to go and, you know, fight this fight. If it means prison, so be it. If it means death, so be it. And Jesus says, Peter, before the, crow, before the rooster crows three times, you're going to deny me three times. Before the rooster crows, you'll deny me three times is what he told him. You see, Peter was looking to do it in his own strength, and his own power. And Jesus is saying, look, Peter, you can't do this in your own power. It's interesting that, that Jesus is going to tell him, look, before I sent you out without, with, with no money bags, with no knapsacks, with no sandals, you guys were going to go. And he goes, did you guys lack anything when, we, when, when you did that? They go, Lord, we lack nothing. This is from now on, when you leave, take your money bag and take your knapsack and take your sword. And right away they think, sword, we're going to fight. All right. What are they thinking? On the natural, rather than the supernatural. And here we are again, Jesus is telling, look guys, you're gonna face temptation, and unless you're prayed up, unless you're in fellowship with God through this time, you're not gonna be able to sustain. You're gonna fall, you're gonna falter. And Jesus addresses them, he says, pray that you may not enter temptation. Now, notice verse 41, it says, and he was withdrawn from them about a stone's throw. He knelt down and prayed. Now, let, 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 me, let me kind of kind of put this together for us. You know, think about what's taking place here. Jesus takes his disciples. Now, John gives us some greater detail. Matthew gives us greater detail. Mark, it seems like Luke is putting more of the tension on Jesus' humanity. The other, uh, the other gospels gives us a little clearer picture of what happened that night. You see, Jesus has taken the, 12, the 11. Remember, Judas has already left. He takes the 11. He brings them to a certain point, And then he gets the three Peter, James, and John, and he says, you guys go a little further with me. They went a little further, and then Jesus says, look, you guys sit here and pray, and then he goes a little further away, and he prays. And as he's praying, one, one of the things you notice here is he's gonna pray this prayer, and the prayer, uh, you know, was that he wouldn't have to endure what he's about to endure. No, no, notice the prayer there in verse 40. One, he says, and he prayed saying, Father, if it is your will, take this cup away from me. Nevertheless, not my will, but yours be done. Notice that prayer. Father, if it's your will, take this cup away from me. Nevertheless, not my will, but your will be done. Now, what, what's, what's amazing in, 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 this, in this particular passage is that Jesus is going, uh, you know, before the throne room of heaven. 
And as, he, as he's before the throne room of heaven, he's asking God, God, if there's any other way for you to accomplish what needs to be accomplished, let's take that other way. Nevertheless, not what I want, God, but what you want. And guys, we're going to see here in this passage, Jesus is agonizing. It tells us that Jesus was sorrowful unto death. Mark says it like this. It says that Jesus uh, prayed and he said, my soul is exceedingly sorrowful even unto death. Stay here and watch as he was talking to the disciples. My soul is exceedingly sorrowful even to the point of death. Now th think about what Jesus has, has transpired, you know, what, what Jesus has confronted up until this point. He was led 40 days and 40 nights into the wilderness at the beginning of his ministry. And Satan tempted him when he was at his weakest physically. And, and Satan tempted him with the, you know, the, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life. He, te he tempted him in every way a man could be tempted as Satan came to him. And Jesus overcame him by the word of God every time. Jesus faced demons and, and, and you know, all kinds of opposition. The, 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 the people in Nazareth tried to push him off a cliff. He walked right to the middle. Jesus didn't fear anything. Not a hint of fear the whole time. But here it says that he was, he was at the point of death. It says that it, he was in agony. And I'm convinced it wasn't because of what was about to happen on the physical realm. It was what was going to happen on the spiritual realm. You see, Jesus was going to go to the cross. He was going to take nails into his wrists, nails through his feet. He was going to be beat beyond recognition. He was going to have a crown of thorns pushed into his head. He was, he was going to have a spear th through his side. And, and, and I don't think that was even the beginning. I don't even think that even touched the surface of what was happening on the spiritual realm. Because the Bible tells us that Jesus came into the world to pay the price for sin. And in order for him to pay the price for sin, he had to become sin. That he became, you know, the, every vile thing that, that you and I have ever done or anyone in this world has ever done was placed upon him. And the Bible says that the wrath of God was poured upon Jesus. And for the first time in all of eternity, man, Jesus and the Father were separated for a moment. Remember when Jesus is on the cross, he says, Father, why have you forsaken me? My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Because for the first time, the broken fellowship between God and Christ took place. And the Bible over and over emphasizes that 2 Corinthians 5.21, it tells us this, for he made him who knew no sin to be sin for us, that we might become the righteousness of God in him. He made him who knew no sin to become sin. It tells us in, in Romans chapter 8 and the third verse, it says this, for what the law could not do in that it was weak through the flesh, God did by sending his own son in the likeness of sinful flesh on account of sin. He condemned sin in the flesh. He condemned sin in the flesh. Who came in the flesh? Jesus. And the condemnation of God and all the wrath of God was placed upon him as he took upon himself the sins of the whole world. And I think that was the greater agony than even the, the, the physical beating and the physical punishment that Jesus would take. Galatians chapter three, verse 13, it says this, Christ has redeemed us from the curse of the law, having become a curse for us, for it is written, cursed is everyone who hangs on a tree. He became the curse as he paid the price for sin. And knowing all of this, knowing what, what the, the, the spiritual ramifications, the separation from God, he says, Lord, if there's any other way, if there's any other possible solution to man's dilemma of sin, let's take that other path. Nevertheless, not my will, but your will be done. Nevertheless, God, it doesn't matter 
what it's going to cost, if that's the only way for this to happen, then so be it. Let your will be done. I think that's, that, 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 that's a, a lesson on prayer, guys. I think, I think when it comes to prayer, really, you know, prayer was never meant for us to try to change God's heart or God's mind. Prayer was so that we would line up our life with God's will. That's what prayer is. And sometimes God's going to allow us to go through the trial or tribulation or some difficulty because he, he wants to, to forge us, to test us, to, to, to strengthen us. And not only that, he wants others to see what it looks like for someone to go through it trusting him. And how many of us are willing to pray like that? God, not what I want, but what you want. This isn't about me, this is about you. I think Jesus has given some incredible lessons, not only to, to, to the disciples, but to us. That we would learn to, to live our life more concerned about the will of God than our own comfort or our own will. And Jesus demonstrated how that looks. Notice what happens there in verse 43. Then at the end, it says, Father, at verse, the end of verse 42, he says, Father, if it's your will, take this cup away from me. Nevertheless, not my will, but your will be done. Then an angel appeared to Jesus from heaven, strengthening him. Man, I love that. What's an angel? An angel is a messenger of God. The Bible tells us that there's two realms. Right? There's the physical realm and then there's the spiritual realm. And in the spiritual realm, there are fallen angels and there are God's angels. And the Bible talks very clearly, man, that you know the fallen angels are demons and they're doing the will of the devil. But then there's the angels of God and they're there to do the will of the Father. And they, the angels come down and they minister, they strengthen Jesus when he was agonizing. He was agonizing, we're gonna see it here in a second, that he was agonizing so much that he was sweating drops of blood out of his pores. That's how much agony he was in knowing what was in front of him and what was about to transpire. And here comes an angel. Now, if Jesus needed to be strengthened from heaven, guys, how much more do you and I need to be strengthened from heaven? If Jesus, the, the Son of God, needed to be strengthened from heaven's messengers, man, how much more we, you and I should be praying, God, give me your strength, and then God, you intervene, and you give me the ability to endure whatever it is that I need to endure so that your will would be accomplished. Jesus is teaching these guys. And he was teaching them these lessons because they are only thinking on the, on, on the natural realm, on the natural plane. And Jesus is teaching them, look, we're not just going to live on the natural plane. We're going to live on the supernatural plane. We're going to live in the spiritual realm. And so Jesus has the disciples as, as, as they're there he, and, and an angel comes. You know, they're watching all of this. Look, 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 at, look at the next verse. It says, then his sweat became like great drops of blood falling down to the ground. Wow. That, that's an actual um, medical condition from mental pressure that a person can actually open up his pores and be dilated so much so that the blood would literally come through someone's pores. They call it blood sweat. And Jesus was in agony, man, carrying upon himself, man, all of the sin man, that, that the world had ever known from the beginning of time until the end of time, all of it placed upon Jesus as he became sin for us. And I think, you know, realizing that, you know, you realize, you know, my sin was placed upon him. And how much more should I desire to live a life of obedience, man, once he's come in and he's transformed our lives, then I'm going, God, I don't want to continue to take for granted what you did on the cross, but I want to live a life of surrender and obedience to God because I understand that it cost him everything. And that we would want to live lives of holiness and obedience to the Lord. And it's incredible because, you know, you look, you look at this whole picture and, and, and you realize that Jesus 
received all the hostility, man, of, of the demonic realm and from the physical realm, from the very people who he created. It tells us in Hebrews 12, three, it says this. He says, for consider him who endured such hostility from sinners against himself, lest you become weary and discouraged in your souls. He goes, consider what Jesus did. Because, when, you know, we can have the poor memes. You ever had those? You always feel so, you know, you always, you, you know, I, everything bad happens to me. And, I, you know, we, we, we get all hung up in the poor meaning. But, but think about Jesus. Think about what he endured from sinners when he never sinned. You and I are sinners. We deserve. <laughs> Jesus didn't deserve any of it. He was sinless. And then it says at the end of that passage in Hebrews in verse in chapter 12 verse 4 he says you have not yet resisted the bloodshed striving against sin and Jesus did he he resisted sin and he came to pay the price against and for sin it's amazing So Jesus comes to his disciples. Notice what happens there in verse 45. And when he rose up from prayer, he had come to his disciples and he found them sleeping from sorrow. And he said to them, why do you sleep? Rise and pray lest you enter into temptation. Now, you know, Passover doesn't happen until after sundown. Some hours have passed. They just had this big, huge meal at the Passover. And then Jesus walks them, you know, across from Jerusalem. You go down into the Kidron Valley. And then you come back up the Mount of Olives. I mean, you know, they, they, it, was, it was, you know, later in the afternoon. They just, Jesus goes, look, I'm going to go pray over here, guys. You guys wait here. I don't want you guys praying unless you fall into temptation. And they, you know, they, you, ever, you ever pray like that? We start praying and then all of a sudden you're right in the middle of like your second sentence and then <sighs> I've had a couple of, I, I don't pray lying down anymore because I know exactly what will happen. I'm just going to lie here and pray. Yeah, right. I'm going to lie here and meditate. <laughs> you see, Jesus, you know, takes them and he's t- warning them, look, All this is about to go down. You guys need to be prepared. And rather than being prepared, they're sleeping. They were clueless to what's going on around them and what was about to transpire. Three times. Now, Luke, again, Luke's just giving us the condensed version. Matthew, Mark, and John give us the expanded version of this. And Matthew tells us in Matthew chapter 26, Matthew says this, watch and pray lest you enter into temptation. The spirit indeed is willing, but the flesh is weak. Guys, our spirit's willing, but what? Our flesh is weak. That's why we need to what? We need to build the spiritual man so that it overpowers the flesh. That's why prayer is so important. Because that's where the spiritual man is built up. That's where the spiritual man is strengthened. It's in the word of God. It's in prayer. It's in doing spiritual activity. The Bible says this. It says the, you, you cannot win the spiritual battle with fleshly powers. For 2 Corinthians 10, 3. If it's for though we walk in the flesh, we don't war according to the flesh, for the weapons of our warfare are not cardinal, but mighty in God for pulling down the strongholds. Not cardinal. You guys know the word cardinal, right? Carne. You eat it all the time. Carne seca. You know what the flesh is all about? You see, our flesh can't win a spiritual battle. The only way that you can win a spiritual battle is in the spiritual realm. And the weapons of our warfare, they're not flesh. They're not carne. They're spiritual. And you have to fight this battle in the spiritual realm. That's prayer. That's the word. That's worship. That's where the spiritual realm takes place. 
And so Jesus here, you know, is warning them, look, guys, you, if you don't pray, and three times he would go over there, he would pray, then he would come back and they're sleeping. Guys, wake up. And then he would go again, he'd go pray, and then he'd come back, they're sleeping. Guys, wake up. And then he comes back the third time, and that's when he says, look, the spirit is willing, but the flesh is weak. And then he says, you guys don't even know, but right around the corner, here comes the guards, and here comes the, the, the Judas, with, and, and all of those that are gonna take us and, and, and have me arrested and put into prison. He says, all of these things are about you. And what happens? They never spent time in prayer. And it's gonna show. <laughs> it's gonna show. Notice, notice what happens there in verse 47. And while he was still speaking, behold, a multitude who was called, and he who was called Judas, one of the 12, went before them and drew near to Jesus to kiss him. And Jesus said to him, Judas, are you betraying the son of man with a kiss? Can you imagine? I mean, Judas went and he had, he had sold out Jesus. 30 pieces of silver, which, is, which, which was very little money. And what, what's incredible is that he, go, he told them, he said, look, the one that I go and kiss, he's the one that you need to arrest. That's, that's, that's Jesus. I, I find it interesting that, that Jesus had to be identified with a kiss. I, I, you know, think how many times portraits of Jesus we see and then, you know, Jesus kind of, you know, standing there and, you know, everyone would know that's Jesus. No one knew who Jesus was. He wasn't glowing. He didn't have a halo. If, if he did, they'd go, look, there's a guy glowing. Just go find him. It's dark. Find the glowing guy. No, it, what, he, none of that. Judas walks up and he gives him a kiss to identify who Jesus is. And then Jesus says, Judas, are you going to betray the son of man with a kiss? What's a kiss? It's a term of endearment. It was, it was, it was a greeting for a friend. And what, 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 what does Judas do? And he turns around and he sells Jesus out and he identifies him with a, ter- a, a term of endearment, a kiss to him. And that would have been a normal customary greeting. They'd go and they'd kiss on the cheek. And, and, and what, what, what G, this is what blows my mind about Jesus, man. Even up to this point, he's trying to reach the soul of Judas. Judas, are you going to betray me with a kiss? Can you imagine what Judas is thinking at that point? He, Jesus was aware of what Judas was doing, and Jesus makes Judas aware that he knew what he was doing. At that moment, Judas could have repented. But Judas, Jesus, and Jesus is still reaching out to him, even, I mean, even after all of this. I mean, think about the love and the grace and the patience of God. I mean, all the way up until the last moment, he's reaching out for Judas to be aware of what he was doing so that he can turn from what he was doing. That's God. It's amazing. Because I want to, I you know, say that would have slapped him. <laughs> I, I mean... What are you doing? Try to kiss me, traitor? No, Jesus didn't do that. Jesus loved them to the end. It's incredible. It's incredible. And I thank God, man, because what what does it declare to us that no matter what we've done, man, God is willing to forgive us. That's how much he loves you. And he's even pursuing you, man, even after you've let him down a thousand times. He's still pursuing you. That's the love of God. He loved you so much that he was willing to endure being separated from the Father and all of your sin and my sin being placed upon him. That's love. Peter at this point, is watching all of this take place. And, you know, we, we, we know Peter, he's the rambunctious one. Look at verse 49. When those around him saw what was going to happen, they said to Jesus, Lord, shall we strike with the sword? I mean, you know, remember Jesus told them, hey, take your sword with you. They literally took their swords. They got an Adam, you know, stashed in, 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 the, in, their, in their robes. 
And they said, Lord, should we strike with a sword? I mean, Lord, is it time to fight? Are we going to fight? We'll do it. You know, and, and then they don't even give Jesus a chance to answer. Peter pulls out a sword. And w- watch what happens. And one of them, now, now this, is, this is incredible. Nobody snitches Peter out except for John. Everyone goes, one of them, <laughs> Matthew, one, you know, one of the guys pulled out a sword, and not John. John goes, Peter did it. <laughs> I love it. Peter's the guy. He was in the flesh that night. Notice this. And one of them struck the servant of the high priest and cut off his right ear. So Peter pulls his sword and he starts flinging it. I don't believe Peter was aiming for an ear. I think he was aiming for a head. And, and, and you know, I just don't think he was a good aim. <laughs> he was a fisherman. He, was, he wasn't a, a, a soldier. He just comes out, <laughs> swinging that thing, you know, there goes that guy's ear. And Jesus, at this point, according to the other accounts, tells us that Jesus picks up the guy's ear. Uh, you know, it's just, it's just incredible. I mean, Mal- Malchus is the guy's name. He was the servant of one of the, of, of the high priest. And Malchus is there. And can you imagine, you know, if your ear is missing, I think you know it. I think, you know, you go grab and there's blood all over the place. You know, you're just kind of standing there. You're kind of in shock. And then here comes Jesus. He kind of bends down. He <laughs> pops his ear back on. And can, can, you, can you imagine how amazed you would be just standing there going, oh, my goodness, what are we dealing with here? Because there's, no, you know, you still got blood in your hands. You got blood all over the side of your head, but it's no, it's no longer pouring out blood. And all of a sudden, it's all back in place. The, uh, uh, tradition says that Malchus became a Christian. Interesting. Do you think that's enough evidence? <laughs> you you kind of had your ear flopping on the ground for a little while, and then you, you all of a sudden it's back on, and not, you know, there, there's no, no, there's no stitches or anything, and you just kind of like, he healed me. My ear was gone, and now it's there. <laughs> and so, so tradition says that, that Malchus became a Christian later. But what's interesting in this, in this, in this whole account, man, is that Jesus is going to address the disciples. And he's going to tell them that he didn't want them to fight with the sword. Matter of fact, Matthew 26, turn there real quick, Matthew chapter 26, verse 52 and 53, man, incredible, incredible. Check this out. Matthew 26, 52, and Jesus said to them, put your sword in its place for all who take the sword will perish by the sword. If you're gonna fight in the natural, you're gonna die in the natural. That's what Jesus is telling him. You're going to take the sword and try, try to defend yourself? He says, let me tell you, you're going to die the same way. But, watch what, look what Jesus says in verse 53. Do you think that I cannot pray to my Father and he'll provide me with more than 12 legions of angels? Guys, one angel wiped out 180,000 Assyrians in one night. And Jesus says, look, do you think with one prayer I could have called to heaven and 180 uh, 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 and and 12 legions. Now, let let me me clarify this. One legion was 6,000. So what Jesus is saying, I I, I can call down 6,000 and 12, you know, 12 times that to come and fight this battle if I so desire Guys, Jesus was not out of control in the circumstantial situation. Jesus wasn't a victim. Jesus willfully offered himself for you and for me. 
And for anyone who would call upon his name, he willfully went to the cross. It wasn't an accident. It wasn't a coincidence. It wasn't a chance. It wasn't a mistake. Jesus went to the cross because there was no other way for man to be saved without him dying on the cross for sin. That's why Jesus says, when, 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 when Jesus was talking to his disciples and he said, Lord, we don't know the way. He says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. And no one comes to the Father except through me. Why? Because that was the only possible way for a person to be made right before God, righteous before God, was by the blood of Jesus Christ, the perfect sacrifice, cleansing that person's sin. There's not another way. There's, there, there's not another avenue to God. No, no, no other religion, no other prophet, no, no, no other way will get you to heaven. There's only one way to heaven and that's through Jesus Christ because he paid the price for sin. No one else was able to pay that price. Only Jesus. And what's incredible, you know, is as you, you, you look at this whole thing play out, I mean, Peter is there, you know, got his sword in his hand, he's there chopping ears off. And, and I think one of the things you, you, you notice is that Peter was trying to accomplish everything in his own power. He was trying to do it in the flesh rather than in the spirit. I like what Warren Wearsby on this passage, he says, Peter had been sleeping when he should have been praying. He had been talking when he should have been listening. He had been boasting when he should have been fearing. And now he was fighting when he should have been surrendering. I like that. And I think it makes all of us have to evaluate, man, how am I handling you know, my decisions in life. Am I trying to do this in my own power or in the wisdom of man? Or am I trying to do this in God's power and the wisdom of God? All of our decisions. How are, you, how are you making your decisions, man? By logic or by prayer? Are you asking God, God, what's your will for my life? Or are you just deciding, man, this is what I think the best solution is rather than seeking the Lord, man, and his heart for your situation. When it comes to your, your, your spouse, who you're gonna marry, when it comes to your job, your career, when it comes to life, man, are we asking God, God, this isn't about what I want. God, what do you want? What do you want? Because the flesh is weak. And we need to be what? Pursuing the spiritual wisdom that God provides us, man. I, I know this. God will guide your steps if you're willing to seek him. God will guide your, your, your decisions if you're willing to ask him. I love Proverbs 3, 5. It says, trust in the Lord with all of your heart and lean not on your own understanding. In all of your ways, acknowledge him and what? He will direct your path. You gotta trust in the Lord. And Jesus has given us an incredible picture here because what he's demonstrated that this isn't about, you know, his will or, or you know, it, it wasn't that, that he wasn't able to change the circumstance or the situation. He had 12 legions of angels that could have come and delivered him from the situation. But he said, you know what? This isn't about what I want. This is about what God wants. And as a result of it, man, he's going to be arrested, he's going to be tried, he's going to be beat, and then he's going to be placed on a cross and condemned. Because he was doing the will of the Father. Heavy. Heavy. And it was God's will that he go to the cross. And that he paid the price for the sins of the whole world. Notice verse 52 and Jesus said to the chief priest, oh, I'm sorry, I skipped for verse 51. And Jesus answered and he said to them, permit even this, and he touched his ear and he healed him. I love that. You know, he goes, Jesus, guys, guys did, allow this to happen. You, you guys aren't gonna fight, right? And we kind of covered that, but Jesus is gonna look, this isn't gonna, gonna be something you get try to deliver me from. This is gonna be the will of the Father that's gonna take place. And then he heals the, the guy and then he turns to the chief priest. Now the chief priest there in verse 52 and the captains of the temple and the elders who had come to him are the ones th that had come to arrest Jesus. Now the Romans had also come, but these were the spiritual leaders in Israel the chief priests, the elders. 
And what's incredible is that Jesus never addressed the Roman soldiers that had come to arrest him. He's addressing those who were supposed to be the spiritual leaders. And he says to them, watch what he says. Have you come out as against a robber with swords and clubs? When I was with you daily in the temple, you did not try to seize me, but this your hour and the power of darkness. Wow. And this is what Jesus is, is, is declaring to them. Look, I've done nothing deserving of what you're about to put me through. In matter of fact, what you're doing is illegal and illegitimate as you arrest me tonight. You're doing it under the shadow of darkness, man. You're not doing it in the light. And the reason they wouldn't do it in the light is because everyone knew that Jesus had come from God. Except for the, except for the, the, the spiritual leaders of Israel. Isn't that wild? The ones that should have been in tune with what God was doing were the ones that were the blindest to what God was doing. It's heavy. And we can be religious and we can miss everything that God wants to do. I mean, that, that just blows my mind. These are the religious leaders and they don't even, they're clueless. They, you know, Isaiah 53 lays out what Jesus would do, the suffering servant. Psalm 22 lays out everything that was transpiring here, and yet they couldn't see it. Why? Because they didn't care about the will of God. They only wanted their own will. And we can walk through life thinking that we're being spiritual and not even concerned about the will of God. That's what the religious leaders were doing. They're putting on this facade of spirituality, but they had no relationship with the God that they claimed to serve. Wow. Not only were they doing it illegally, Jesus says every day, man, I was in the temple and I was there um, teaching, healing. I was doing the miracles. I was there right in your midst and you watched me and you saw me and none of you tried to arrest me then because you had a greater fear of man than you did of God. The reason they didn't arrest Jesus is because they knew that the people thought that Jesus was a, was, was a messenger from God and they didn't want to upset the people. So what they did is they waited till they got Jesus alone kind of privately aside and then they would arrest him. And they would do it all under the cover of night, under the cover of darkness. No, that, that's, that's exactly what, what Jesus conveys to them. He says, look, this is your hour. This is your hour. And the power of darkness is our too. And what Jesus is saying is that you guys have teamed up with the devil. That's what he's saying. You guys have teamed up with the devil. The hour of darkness. Now, over and over, Jesus kept saying, my hour has not come, my hour has not come. And what you need to understand, I think in, 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 the, in the spiritual realm, this was heaven's hour, and this was the, the, the earth's hour, and this was the devil's hour, and Heaven's hour was gonna, tr was, gonna, was gonna triumph over all of it. He was gonna triumph over all of it. Because what's, what's about to transpire, man, is that God was gonna bring a victory over the devil and over all of the religious leaders, man, as he goes to the cross and he pays the price for sin for the whole world. It was heaven's victory. And it was... Satan's defeat. <laughs> Even though Satan thought that he was getting over right now. And he wasn't. Incredible. That this was the hour of darkness. Now, what's interesting, early in John chapter 9, let's turn there real quick. John chapter 9, we're going to wrap this up. John chapter 9, look at verse 4. And I, I found this to be an interesting passage in light of Jesus making that statement. This is the power of darkness and and, you know, this is your hour. Look what Jesus says, John chapter 9, verse 4. He says, I must work the works of him who sent me while it is day. The night is coming when no one can work. As long 
As I am in the world, I am the light of the world. And when he said these things, he spat on the ground and he made clay with the saliva and he anointed the eyes of the blind man with the clay and the blind man was able to see as a result of it. I find that ironic because Jesus is saying, look, I'm gonna, I know that not am I, am I the light of the world, I came to bring light into those that are in darkness. And that's what Jesus came to do. He came to bring light to those that are in darkness. If those that are in darkness would humble themselves and acknowledge, man, you know what, I need to be forgiven for my sin. I understand Jesus came into this world for the very reason uh, to, to forgive sin. And the moment I put my faith in Jesus Christ, my sins get washed away. That's the gospel. In John chapter, first John chapter one, verse seven, I love this. He says, if we walk in the light as he's in the light, we have fellowship with one another. Check this out. And the blood of Jesus Christ, his son, cleanses us from all sin. If we walk in the light, just like he's in the light. And we have fellowship with one another. What does that mean? That means that we have, we have a commonness. We have a communion. We have, we, we, we have koinonia. That, that's this idea that you and I as Christians, man, we have a bond because we have the same father. That means we have fellowship with one another. And not only that, man, the blood of Jesus Christ cleanses us from, I love this, all sin. He didn't say some sin. He said, all sin. And it, Jesus is able to cleanse from all sin because he came, he, he came into the world to be the payment for it. 1 John chapter 4, verse 10, just a few pages down uh, from, from that passage, it says, in this is love, not that we love God, but that he loved us. And he sent his son to be a propitiation for our sins. The propitiation is a payment. And the only way sin could be removed is if a payment was made for that sin. The Bible says this, the wages of sin is death and the only payment that can be made for sin is death. And Jesus became sin and then he died. Death. So that his, the, the payment of sin was satisfied. And if that payment of sin isn't satisfied by Jesus, then you have to pay that price on your own. And that death is an eternal spiritual death that'll take place. That's why, that's why, man, what Jesus did here, I, I think is, is, is pivotal for the whole gospel message here. We're gonna, we're gonna study the next few weeks, the death and, and, and you know, the crucifixion and we're, we're gonna, the trial that Jesus is gonna endure, but I think all of it you know, sums up here. I think this is the hour that Jesus wrestled with whether you know, you know how, how this was gonna go down. And, and, and it was there where he was agonizing over what was gonna transpire. And yet he submitted himself to the will of the Father in the middle of all of that. And it's, and it's incredible. To this morning, we're gonna partake of communion together. We're, we're gonna take the bread and the cup and we're gonna remember what he did. The guys, we're, we do that on a regular basis. Once a month, we, we, we partake of communion because I, I think it needs to be one of those things that we're constantly reminded of, that Jesus paid the price for sin. It was his body and it was the covenant in his blood that was written so that you and I can be forgiven and be made right with God. And it's something that we can't lose sight of. That's why we do it on a regular basis so that we do, that we continue to keep the main thing, the main thing. And the main thing is that Jesus loves you and he died for you. And he rose from the grave and he conquered death. And those who receive him also conquer death along with him. His victory is your victory if you put your faith in him.